Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this kickoff webinar and discussion on the need for a specimen management plan requirement. Uh, my name is Jyotsna Pande, and I serve as the public policy director for the American Institute of Biological Sciences, uh, an umbrella organization for a number of biological science societies. I also serve as the executive director for the Natural Science Collections Alliance, which is an association that supports museums, herbaria, botanic gardens, universities, and other institutions that house natural science collections. I'm also a member of BCON or the Biodiversity Collections Network, a group that I will introduce shortly. Um, so today's program is a joint effort of BCON and the US Culture Collection Network and is co-hosted by AIBS and NSCA. Before we get started, I just wanna take a moment to make some housekeeping announcements. Uh, so this program is being recorded and the recording will be sh shared online after the program. You may use the chat feature to interact with panelists and attendees and to introduce yourself. Um, if you are experiencing any, any technical difficulties, please go ahead and contact AIBS IT support via chat. Um, and please use the Q&A feature on Zoom to type in your questions for the speakers. We will address your questions after all the presentations. Um, to give you a brief overview of what's in store today, we'll start with some background about the issue of a specimen management plan requirement, introduce you to the two groups leading a community effort on this topic, get into the nitty gritties of what is a specimen management plan, what are its elements, why do we need it, and uh, what are its benefits uh, to various stakeholders. And then we'll delve into some case studies and examples from culture collections uh, and the NEON and Arctic biorepositories. And we'll then get into a panel discussion and take questions from the audience. Now to start off, I just wanna provide some context and background by saying a few words about why we're talking about this today and uh, what is the current status of this requirement in the policy landscape. Now the National Academy's report on biological collections, which came, came out in 2020, um, explored the contributions of biological collections, um, outlined critical needs and challenges they face and, uh, and made several sort of recommendations for maintaining and growing collections and their use in, uh, to advance science. So one of the recommendations from that report was that NSF, in order to continue providing support for collections infrastructure, should require a specimen management plan for all research proposals that involve collecting or generating specimens. And that such a plan should, be, should describe how the specimens and associated data will be accessioned into and permanently maintained in an established biological collection. So after the, after the Academy's report came out, this recommendation was incorporated by the House Science Committee the following year in their sprawling bill, the NSF for the Future Act, which proposed major new investments in, in the National Science Foundation and called out collections as a fundamental research priority for the, for the agency. And the bill specifically called for continued NSF support for improving collections infrastructure, digitization, and access to collections. It called for the establishment of an action center for biological collections. Uh, and it supported the idea of a specimen management plan requirement for proposals that generate specimens. So as that bill sort of moved through the house, it went through a few uh, changes and ended up in the America Competes, Competes Act, which combined several other major science bills. And the Senate had their own counterpart science and technology bill, which, they, which did not include the collections related provisions. So after several months of negotiations between the House and the Senate to reconcile the two bills, during which members of BCON, AIBS, Spinach, and NSCA strongly advocated for the inclusion of the collections language, uh, Congress ended up passing what is now known as the Chips and Science Act, which retained the collections language, a big win for science and, and for collections. And now one, of, one thing to note is that uh, the enacted version of the bill states that the specimen management plan should be included as part of the data management plan, which was not specified in earlier iterations of the bill. And currently there's uh, only a cursory mention of uh, specimen curation in the required data management plan that's associated with NSF bio proposals. So further guidance is currently evaded from, from NSF. So, you know, as such, you know, BCON and, and USCCN uh, have, have, joined, have jointly drafted um, a proposal that fleshes out more details, outlining the elements of a specimen management plan and articulating the needs and benefits of such a requirement for various communities. Um, it suggests that a specimen management plan provide more detailed information regarding the collection, digitization, curation, and care 
for accession specimens associated with NSF funded research. And it makes a recommendation for how to move forward with an implementation of this requirement. So we hope that you've had a chance to read this proposal, but don't worry if you haven't. Uh, we'll delve into it today with the goal of opening up this discussion to a wider community. Uh, we think that it's critical to meaningfully engage the living and preserved collections communities, as well as the research community, to develop this requirement and, and, and the best practices around it. And we want to hear from you. We need your input to strengthen this proposal with the goal of sharing it with NSF uh, uh, after incorporating input from the broader, broader community. Now, at this point, I want to take a moment to introduce Beacon. So if you haven't heard of us, uh, Beacon emerged from an NSF RCN grant awarded to AIBS that resulted in the extended specimen report, which was released in 2019. And the report issued a community-informed call for the development of, uh, of an extended specimen network as a, as a unifying goal for, for biological collections over the next decade. And Beacon brings together representatives from a wide range of US biological collections and continues to advocate for and promote the development of the extended specimen network. And the idea of a specimen management plan requirement very much supports this vision and thus our interest in this issue. Now our community includes both living and preserved collections and through our steering committee, Beacon represents a wide range of biological science societies, natural history museums, botanic gardens, herbaria, paleontological collections, uh, living collections, including culture and, and, and zoological collections and other research centers and, and organizations. And you'll be hearing from some of our steering committee members during today's program. Um, I, I now want to invite Dusty Gallagher to introduce our partner in this effort, which is the U.S. Culture Collection Network. Dusty, over to you. Thank you very much, and, and thank you to all of those who have joined us today. Uh, my name is Dusty Gallagher. I'm the USCCN U.S. Culture Collection Network Project Manager, which is a, a project within the International Alliance for Phytobiomes Research. And we uh, the USCCN is about 10 years old, um, and we um, are currently in our second phase um, of a NSF research coordinated network um, funding, and we bring together scientists working in living microbial collections. Our vision and mission is that we uh, enhance the quality and availability of microbial resources and that we're a resource for all of those collections and their users. Um, we want to make sure that there is a long-term viable plan for making sure that those resources are sustainable and are actively engaged in the broader um, research community. Um, we have a, a website um, that's listed there on the slide, and we hope that you visit that site for more information. Next slide, please. Our main goal within um, our new funded project is really to expand the current network. Um, we want to increase awareness and enhance collaborations among our collections and its users. One of the ways that we hope to do that is via a collections registry that is now live and on our website. And so we invite all collection uh, culture collections to visit our site and go to the registry, enter your collection there and some information about it. And then um, that will create a searchable database um, so that um, your resources can be used in research. That link is also there available. So we invite all of you to, to participate in our network and register your collection. Next slide, please. Our involvement in our structure within this um, subject and more is through um, our steering committee as well as other operating committees. And so this issue of a, spe a, of a potential specimen management plan requirement resides within our standards and procedures committee. And so they have been reviewing and participating in the proposed plan. And um, they are very interested in hearing from you and your thoughts about the need for a specimen management plan. So we invite you to be active, enter your questions and your comments as we move on throughout the program. So thank you for this opportunity. And I would now like to introduce Brita Zimkus from Beacon, and she will start discussing exactly what a spe specimen management plan is and some of its elements. 
Thanks, Dusty. So now we're going to dive in and talk about what is a specimen management plan. So the specimen management plan would comprehensively address specimen deposition, digitization, care and curation to ensure that collections would be adequately safeguarded and ethically managed for future research. Um, and I should say here by specimens, um, we're talking about really any biological specimens that could include uh, living and preserved collections, including paleontological collections. So um, the idea is that researchers, when they embark on a project, when they start, they would reach out to a biorepository when they're preparing their NSF grant and discuss potential specimen deposition. Um, there's a conversation there, and if the specimens meet the criteria of that biorepository, they would work collaboratively to put together the specimen management plan. And the idea is that this is going to complement but not duplicate the required data management plan. Next slide, please. So researchers should understand that collections may not accept anything when everything. Uh, most collections have a criteria. Um, they want to make sure that whatever they're accepting is going to go along with the institution's mission, programmatic goals, and collecting scope. scope. Um, one of the first questions that's likely going to be asked is, does the collection fit physically within the existing storage space of the biorepository? If it doesn't, um, do we need to purchase new things or, or is this not the place for the collection? The other question that has become more relevant as a result of the Nagoya Protocol and benefit sharing agreements is whether there are any legal limitations on downstream use. On the box on the right is a list from the 2009 Interagency Working Group on Scientific Collections Report, which includes factors that federal agent agencies consider when making decisions about what they accept and maintain. So, for example, they may be prioritizing rare species um, specimens that allow researchers to address urgent problems or those that are costly or difficult to acquire. So the take home message is that different biorepositories may have different criteria. Uh, next slide, please. One other thing to mention is that um, researchers should realize that it's possible that only part of their collection may be accepted by the, by the biorepository and they should address um, what will happen with any other specimens that are not accepted. Um, for example, uh, a researcher might say in their specimen management plan that tissues not selected for deposit will be cryopreserved in the PI's research lab for a specific period of time after the conclusion of the project. Next slide, please. Not surprisingly, the first element of a specimen man management plan is the anticipated number of specimens and details regarding the preparation types. So this part of the SMP would outline details about um, the taxa, how they were potentially identified, maybe it's by morphology or sequencing, where and when they were collected, whether a single uh, collecting event or over a span of time, protocols for preservation and any storage requirements, information about labeling, all those details about the actual specimens themselves. And one last thing to mention is how are they going to get from the PI's institution to the biorepository? Who's going to pay for that and who's responsible? Uh, next slide, please. The next major element is um, the data, the associated data. Um, the specimen management should address uh, any data, data associated with those specimens, referencing data standards that complement the emerging recommendations for the digital extended specimen. Um, institutions likely have minimum data requirements and they may ask for be data, data to be formatted in a specific way. Um, many institutions can streamline that process. They may have online submission forms or standardized spreadsheets. Here you can see something that we can provide to uh, researchers um, that we give from the Museum of Comparative Zoology that explains all the different um, columns that we have in our data bulk loader. Next slide, please. The third major element is cost estimates for the repository to curate, digitize, and care for the material. This would ensure that part of the project budget includes a specific amount for funding to cover these costs for an approximate number of specimens. Next slide, please. Lastly, the specimen management plan would outline how the specimens and associated data would be made available to the larger research community. 
Um, for example, specimens would be made available for loan by request for the purposes of research, education, and exhibition. Data would be made publicly available in an online collection management system, and data would be shared with data aggregators like IDIGBio and GBIF. Um, it's important to note that both researchers depositing, depositing specimens and the biorepository need to collaboratively ensure that all national and international permits and agreements that govern the specimen maintenance and use are understood and tracked. Uh, and next slide, please. We will now have Andy Bentley from the BCON Steering Committee talk about the need for a specimen management plan and benefit, benefits to the various stakeholder groups. Thanks, Brida. Um, so one of the major motivations for a specimen management plan is that obviously specimens, although they're integrally linked to the data that's associated with them, have very different needs in terms of infrastructure, curation, and care that are not adequately addressed in the current data management plan um, as it exists at the moment. Currently, there's only tangential mention of specimens in the existing data management plan that does not adequately address the needs of stakeholders, nor provide for a budget to fund the acquisition, the curation, the digitization, and the care of these collections. A specimen management plan would also hopefully address deposition of research materials in collections in a timely and efficient manager, ma manner, and hopefully minimize these dark collections that languish in labs for extended lengths of time and are not available for downstream research because they're not lodged with a formal collection. A detailed specimen management plan would also increase the value of these collections, both individually and collectively and contribute to the open, fair science and the digital extended specimen ideal with respect to data integration. Next slide, please. So let's look at some of the benefits um, that, this, that a specimen management plan would have to these numerous stakeholders. Firstly, the researchers who collect and cu curate the material, the collections and the institutions that are tasked with caring for this material, the funding agencies that fund both of the above, and the publishers who then disseminate their results of the research um, as well as the collections information. Next slide, please. So first, first let's look at the researchers. Um, so one of the things that a specimen management plan would, would do is it would promote a dialogue between the researchers and the repository during the grant, grant writing stage and would ensure that the collection can actually accept the materials and that the community-wide and discipline-specific standards and best practices are being followed for those specimens. Collections would also be able to advise and assist in adherence to national and international laws and regulations, things like the Nagoya Protocol, um, IACUC um, 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 institutions, um, IRB, biosafety and biosecurity, as well as ethical guidelines. Collections can also facilitate information about existing collections that are already lodged with, with their collection um, and research projects providing um, for collaborative opportunities and prevent du the duplication of effort. A sound collection plan and good quality specimens would ensure the efficient use of the funds and maximize the impact of these specimens and data collected far beyond the current project. Next slide, please. So next we look at the collections and the institutions or research organizations that house those collections. Um, they would receive high quality specimens and metadata associated with those specimens that have been legally collected and preserved in a format that are compatible with their storage needs. They would receive data that adheres to standards and best practices and that is compatible with their collection management systems. Funding would be available to catalog, digitize, maintain, and curate these specimens in accordance with NSF's mandate to fund the entire research and endeavor. And these funds would be directed to collections that are actively, actively in use and growing. NSF would thus be creating an equitable allocation of resources, reinforcing broad training in life sciences and creating a more sustainable infrastructure in support of the extended specimen. It would also potentially provide uh, maybe confidential early access to information about cutting edge research and its outcomes, allowing them to plan on how to fulfill these emerging needs with the collections that they already house. Next slide, please. Next, we look at the funding agencies. Um, obviously, it would provide NSF um, a larger return and an earlier return on their investment in collections that can leverage future specimen and data, data based research. It would give them a clearer view and associated metrics of which repositories preserve specimens generated through research funding. And this could more efficiently highlight areas of need in collections infrastructure. 
All collections that receive accessions from NSF funded research, including small and overlooked ones, would receive some NSF funding in amounts that reflect the collection's value to NSF funded research. And it would also be seen to be supporting reproducible and ethical science in relation to specimen management and the many benefits that accrue from specimens and their data. Next slide, please. And lastly, we look at the publishers. Um, it would better equip publishers to fulfill their mandate of exposing reproducible science through the provision of more robust material examine sections in publications. They would benefit from the guidance included in a specimen management plan to increase the uniformity of citation and attribution of specimen information to support the extended specimen. It would empower them to make the links between research funding dollars and collections information more transparent. It would also better equip them to facilitate compliance with national and international permitting agreements. And the specimen management plan could reduce publishing delays and bottlenecks due to a lack of staff to enforce and follow these publishing uh, mandates. Next slide, please. So next we're gonna move on to some, um, some examples um, of ways in which a specimen management plan could or is currently being implemented in various case studies. Um, and we'll start off with living microbial collections and carrier boundary mills. Thank you, Andy. So uh, I'm the curator of the FOF Yeast Culture Collection at the University of California, Davis. And just a quick recap, the, the specimen management plan is a document that researchers would write and include with their NSF proposals. And the purpose is to facilitate this process for researchers that would deposit yeasts in my collection. I wrote a draft template of a specimen management plan. And that I've shown a screenshot of it here. And I'll talk about some of the elements. So I wanna note first that I wrote this document before the specimen management plan became a section in the data management plan, the length and the format will be adjusted as NSF decides the format such as the page limits. So the goal of providing a template to researchers writing NSF proposals is to make this process as painless as possible. So this draft template has it's very simple format it's fill in the blanks a lot of pre written text what's highlighted in yellow is sample text that researchers would replace with their specific case materials. So again this SMP is a commitment between the collection and the researcher the collection would receive selected materials if that NSF proposal is funded. So the goal of a specimen management plan overall includes avoiding misunderstandings between the researcher and a repository. Next slide, please. So there are several issues that have already been discussed. The, the list of components of a specimen management plan was already listed. There are quite a few issues that I, as a curator of a yeast collection, need to address before I receive uh, yeasts from researchers. And there's some common elements with other types of collections. And I will discuss a few of these issues related to the draft specimen management plan template for the FOF collection. Next slide, please. So the, the specimen management plan could include links to some important documents that are posted on the FOF collection website. For example, in addition to specimens we, that are in a specific format, we need to receive data in a specific format. Um, so the SMP could include links to two documents on the FOF collection website. And that includes this online deposit agreement form, which covers terms such as how the, how the specimens will be preserved, how they'll be uh, shared with third parties, and also a link to the collection's online specimen data form. So this is a spreadsheet that researchers would fill out as they are collecting the specimens. And it's color coded in various categories of required versus nice to have data. So, for example, the section is in green is fields that are required for inclusion of these uh, yeasts in the global catalog of microorganisms. So this is helps us to 
adhere to international data standards. Next slide, please. So of course, there's uh, information in here about the number of specimens, the kinds of specimens, and how the collections cost will be covered. So there's sample text in there that would be replaced with the specifics for uh, by the researcher writing the proposal, including text about how much funding is in the, the grants budget for covering the costs of the FOF collection to for accession of those specimens. Next slide, please. Also important is the distribution terms. For example, uh, the FOF collection has a research license agreement on our uh, website. Whenever researchers order a yeast strain, they click a button saying, I agree to these terms. This is the terms they're agreeing with. This is, uh, so having a link to the distribution terms in the specimen management plan clarifies that the researcher understands that other researchers in the future will be using these specimens. Some researchers might want to some extra time to complete their analysis to write the publications. So, for example, the timing of release of the specimens to the, uh, the general catalog might be negotiated a delay of three years for our five years or 10 years. And uh, next slide, please. Another issue that could be in the specimen management plan could be some validation, some compliance issues. For example, if there could be a signature by the curator of the collection that they approved that plan on a specific date before the proposal was submitted to NSF. There could also be a section uh, if NSF it would like to have a validation that the researcher really did deposit those specimens, there could be information on how that information will be uh, conveyed back to NSF. Next slide, please. Um, and next speaker is Nico Franz, who will discuss the NEON biorepository. Yeah, thank you, uh, Kiria. That was uh, excellent and very pertinent. Um, so I'm a faculty member in life sciences at ASU, currently the principal investigator of the NEON biorepository. As many of you may know, NEON stands for National Ecological Observatory Network. This is a large-scale long-term ecological monitoring and forecasting project that accumulates about 100,000 biosamples on an annual basis. And the biorepository houses these samples and makes them in associated data available for external research projects. Some relevant context here, in order to operate this project, we have dedicated NSF-funded NEON biorepository personnel. We also have a specific statement of work with the main NEON contractor at Battelle Memorial Institute. And so this statement provides boundaries on the kinds and the volumes of services that we must provide relative to the biorepository operations and to achieve the funded scope. But based on these boundaries, there's therefore also functional space where we can be contracted uh, through a separate NSF grant or other external resources to do things that are quote unquote, on, uh, above and beyond our baseline scope. NEON calls these um, sort of task assignable assets, a term used to designate uh, projects that are optional additional services that leverage the collections infrastructure and personnel, but do so on demand and on a fee basis. And so finding, defining, uh, defining and making uh, the consistent in scope versus out of scope boundaries suitably public and operational is, to my mind, an exercise that any managed collection and collections community uh, can engage in at any time. Um, so then in this particular example schema, uh, there is an external uh, proposed project request uh, requesting access to our cryo collection space to store up to 2,500 uh, DNA extractions. As you can see, in order to uh, calculate a potential uh, fee related to this request, uh, we set the minimum space unit uh, in our freezers to one cubic foot. Uh, we conducted research on the going monthly or annual market prices, uh, both in academia and beyond for minus 80 storage, and then multiplied this value by the annual rate uh, of the annual rate by 30 years. Uh, we also uncritically uh, charge for related labor based on the respective position salary and employee related expenses. Uh, we detail what the services will entail, so lots of parallels there, including a sample and data processing, and we stipulate our expectations towards the client providing the samples and data, 
including how we're going to manage and publish value added data in the Neon Bio Repository data portal. So with that, I'm passing on to Dr. Kristen O'Brien of the University of Alaska Fairbanks, who will talk about the Antarctic Biorepository Initiative. Thank you, Thank you, Nico. Hey, uh, I'm a fish physiologist and I've conducted research in Antarctica for about 20 years. And in 2022, I was involved in co-organizing a workshop along with my collaborator, Lisa Crockett, and uh, curators and others from the Smithsonian National Museum of, Natu of Natural History. And we brought together curators, collection managers, and Antarctic investigators to discuss the value and scope of a potential Antarctic biorepository of, of specimens. In advance of the workshop, we deployed a survey to assess the status of US Antarctic collections and attitudes towards a biorepository. We received 87 responses from 56 institutions that included 31 curators or collection managers and 50 PIs. And the outcomes from that survey, uh, the data uh, indicated that PIs have large, extensive, undiscoverable collections. But interestingly, those publicly available collections are underutilized. 58% um, uh, of the respondents indicated that their collections were rarely or never used, rarely meaning a request was made only once every few years. And yet there's a very high interest among PIs in accessing and depositing specimens. 68% reported a high or very high interest in donating specimens, and 70% indicated a very high or high interest in obtaining specimens. The major barriers to deposition uh, were perceived as being cost and the time and effort to prepare their specimens. And the primary barriers to accessing specimens included the difficulty in finding the specimens needed, the costs, and some concerns about sample integrity. Next slide, please. Following the workshop, uh, members that were involved in the workshop provided recommendations to the National Science Foundation. One was to establish a central virtual hub by a repository that manages standardization of collections and data across multiple existing physical repositories. A second was to require a specimen management plan. Another was invest in education on best practices for specimen management and collection for PIs facilitate opportunistic sampling in Antarctica, and prioritize and incentivize the deposition of legacy samples. Following uh, our, rec our recommendations to NSF, the NSF um, came out with a Dear Colleague letter, letter that included an update to the data management plan that includes a specimen, specimen management plan, although uh, it's not, I guess it's not as a bona fide specimen management plan, but required in the data management plan is now that specimens must be deposited in a publicly accessible archive within two years of collecting or by the end of the award, whichever comes first. And the data management plan must include information on how specimens and associated data will be accessioned into an established long-lived collection. And it encourages collaboration from, between PIs and repositories early in the proposal process. Thank you, Kristen, and to, to all of our speakers for those informative comments. Um, <clears throat> so this, uh, with this, we come to the end of the presentations and we'll now move on to our panel discussion. Um, to moderate this panel, I would like to invite BCON Steering Committee member, Dori Contreras, who is a curator of paleobotany at the Perro Museum of Nature and Science. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining. If y'all been keeping an eye out, we have had a Q&A going in the chat. There is a tab in there for answered questions. So some of our members have been answering uh, questions in the chat as we've gone along. So definitely check those out. Um, we do have a uh, lineup of panelists uh, to be able to discuss implications for various communities. Um, as a For an SMP, uh, who y'all haven't heard of from yet today is Barbara Thier. She's with Beacon and um, is director of the New York Botanical Garden. So she'll be representing preserved collections. Um, the remainder of our panel are people you've been hearing from throughout this presentation. Kyria Bounty Mills with the Culture Collections, Kristen O'Brien uh, discussing polar programs, Nico Franz talking about people dimensions, workforce improvements and employee employment opportunities, as well as Andy Bentley and uh, Brita Zimkus. 
Um, so we have a few uh, questions going in the chat. Please continue to add these as, as you think about them and we will try and address as many as we can in the remaining time that we have. And it looks like we have about, uh, about 15 minutes or so that we can um, kind of open up and discuss and answer questions before wrapping up. Um, so one of the outstanding questions currently, and this was uh, posed by Matthew Pace, is can the group please discuss how this might affect funding of non-US international collections? Uh, for example, when doing international field work, the first set of specimens must remain in the home country. When working in groups where only unikits can be collected, all specimens will be housed on international non-US collections. Um, if someone could uh, speak to how that might. I think Andy has, has already partially um, answered that, or maybe he's entirely answered it, but um, the agreement wouldn't, wouldn't interfere in any way, as far as I can imagine, with whatever international agreements are. I think this would only refer to specimens that were being housed um, uh, you know, in, in, in a home country. However, uh, I suppose this is just part of the negotiation you would do with the, um, with the, with your collaborating institutions. And, um, perhaps there, there would be, you know, NSF would consider funds that could go to an international institution. They don't generally do that. So I don't know that it would be of any benefit to the country that the, to the institution in the home country that hosts the, um, the, the, the first set, but it would certainly could apply to those that do come back to be housed in a U.S. Uh, institution. Yeah, I think any specimen management plan would need to have provisions for those sort of repository agreement type of arrangements where right. some of the material is being housed in an international institution. But in some cases, you know, having an upfront conversation with that repository in a in a in an international country is sometimes more important because they have less resources, they have less people available to be able to curate that material. And so it can be just as important to have that conversation with an international collection as it can a US one. Great, thank you. Um, so another Katie Pearson has uh, asked, what consideration in the SMP is there to spreading out the load of specimen management among institutions so that it's not only uh, the very popular or otherwise well-known bio repositories who get contacted about depositing specimens? Um, I'd like, to, I'd like to chime in on that. So one of the purposes of the, um, the registry that you, the U.S. Culture Collection Network has launched is to gather information about the many different types of microculture collections and what different specialties they offer. So that registry will be a great way for researchers to find a repository for their specific type of microbes. And I'm sure there's uh, other types of registries for the other types of collections. Yes, there are, and that would be a good source to consult. Um, uh, this is more in the area, I would think, of, of what would be sort of recommendation, recommendations or best practices more than any kind of requirement for a plan. Um, but it, you raise a good point, Katie, that, 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 that there really probably should be uh, some best practices about uh, how one chooses a repository if you don't already, you know, have one in mind. And I think that's something that um, that should be discussed, you know, further, probably not a requirement in the plan, but it could certainly be something that NSF proposal reviewers would consider whether or not you have chosen the most appropriate uh, repository for your specimens. Great, thank you all. Um, Gary Rosenberg asks, how can one ensure that the specimens covered by an agreement are actually deposited? Well, I think a lot of that would get would get into the whole extended specimen um, concept in terms of if that data was published out to the outside world, you would be able to track the fact that those specimens came from a particular research project. 
um, and you would be able to track, you know, the whole process of, um, you know, lodging those specimens with a repository, publishing them out, digitizing them, and then tracking them through the research products that are created based on that research. I mean, in a perfect world, this would be something that that whoever had the grant would report on in their final report that the specimens have been transferred and all, all, um, all of the requirements have been met. However, I think we all know that specimens, you know, may linger for many years after the funding is required because we weren't able to identify them in the course of the project, and that that is um, definitely, I think, an an issue that uh, could be of concern. And that actually leads well into a question that Matt Bies asked, um, which I don't know if we really have an answer to yet, but um, uh, posed whether it's worthwhile to distinguish between acquisition and long-term storage costs, where an SMP can cover the acquisition and identification of specimen costs, but um, kind of differentiating how the perpetual long-term storage of specimens can be funded, given that funding is I, I address finite. I addressed this somewhat in, a, in an answer that I gave to somebody else's question. I, I agree. Um, there's obviously no, there's no way that we can require a researcher to fund the, the, the long-term storage of, a, of specimens in perpetuity. Um, but there, there, there is sort of an amount of money that you can put into a proposal to fund the acquisition, the digitization, and the curation of those specimens. Um, you know, and and the care of those specimens during that procedure. So it wouldn't be sort of an indefinite amount of time. It would be a certain a certain a certain amount of time that that research project would be on the hook, so to speak, um, for funding the the sort of acquisition and care of those specimens. Great. I think that's actually a good point. You know, one of the things that our team has um, considered a lot is kind of how the SP affects kind of our workforce and the people that actually care for these and deal with these specimens long term. Um, I wonder if, uh, Nico, you may want to mention for a minute things in, in response to workforce improvements and kind of how basically how SP requirements would affect the workforce at collections institutions. And yeah. Thank you, Dory. I think it's a, it's an interesting topic. Uh, I think this is something new that our community is now facing. And pretty much any new thing is an opportunity for us to manage it well. I think that's my, my first point, that whatever this new thing is, it's also a management opportunity where we can sort of showcase our management ability. The other thought that I have is to think about the SMP in a very important way uh, in relation to services, right? Uh, and that means personnel. So services related to specimens, somebody, even if the space that a particular collection has to acquire specimens is amazing, uh, in the end of the day, the functionality will be very closely related to uh, services related to the specimens, services related to the data, including, for example, implementation of fair and care data principles, and other project related services. And to that extent, given that there are, and I don't know my numbers, thousands of uh, sort of research active collections in our nation. And many of them have the opportunity to uh, somehow uh, partake in, in NSF proposals. And then there's lots of other labs that do actually uh, accrue samples that could be added to this, right? So this uh, is potentially very systemic at a scale where uh, we have opportunities both within our institutions and as a community to uh, revalue uh, our worth, our worth to others, and, and, and how to uh, sort of conceptualize and then ultimately uh, you know, really price out uh, the services that, that we can be providing. And, and, and I think that's as much as I wanted to say maybe as an opening. Great, thank you, Nico. And I hopefully that helps answer some of the other questions that are coming up in the chat that um, I've talked about kind of, especially for different types and sizes of institutions, how support needed would be different for different institutions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so taking uh, some new questions, um, 
uh, one that just popped up, who will set the standards for curation of collections? The few published standards for most groups are uh, sadly inadequate. Yeah, we've, we've talked a lot about that. And um, it would be a great activity to, to go along with the establishment of a specimen management plan for the different collections communities to uh, either write these, these standards if they don't exist to update them and then to, um, to kind of make them available through a common, through a, you know, some kind of a common portal. Um, that's definitely a task that would make this whole thing uh, work a lot more smoothly, I think. Nice, thank you, Barbara. Um, one of the questions we got, and I think this is pretty interesting. So our current version of the SMP draft proposal doesn't actually mention evidence or vouchers specifically by term. Was there any intention behind that terminology choice or? No, probably just an oversight. Hmm. Okay. I know the living collections people don't use the term voucher. Uh, we were trying to use language in, in all cases that would apply to the wide range of um, collection objects that exist. And that's probably what happened there. Uh, we were trying to be inclusive and not exclude any com community that doesn't use the same terminology for their collected items. Thank you, Barbara. That's a very good point. It's covering so many communities. We have a whole bunch of different uh, just kind of practices and standards and, and ways of communicating about specimens. Um, so an interesting comment, you know, we've now, uh, this was by Barnabas Dalru, and now we have a massive immune accumulation, oh, I'm losing the question, of observation only records, and especially from citizen science projects that are really uh, kind of growing in number. and. Uh, as mentioned here, fast overthrowing records from voucher specimens. Are there ways to equally encourage citizen science collecting of voucher specimens, or is the collecting of vouchers a task for professional collectors? I think one of the issues is that there are so many permitting regulations and so many hoops that you need to jump through in order to be able to collect vouchers and vouch them with a collection. Um, that it would be difficult for the majority of citizen scientists to actually collect vouchers along with observational records. Um, it, it, I think it would simply be just too much, you know, too many, too many weird wrinkles in the plan, so to speak, um, in order for them to do so. I will say that in, in certain areas, for example, where I am in Denver, there's a whole host of extremely talented amateur botanical collectors associated um, who've done, contributed hugely to the floor of Colorado. And I know there are efforts in the mycological community to encourage the, the huge network of um, citizen mycologists who exist to learn to make um, you know, vouchers. But as Andy said, the permitting issue you know, is a requirement. I, as, as far as I can see in the National Forest Service, uh, where I've applied for permits, they certainly don't care whether you have a PhD or not. Um, so, so it doesn't necessarily, you're not necessarily precluded from, from making specimens, but, um, I think it, it obviously depends a lot on the organisms. Plants are a lot easier than vertebrates, for example. Great. So, um, one, and this was more of a, uh, a comment, but I think it's worth, uh, bringing up now fast moving questions or moving answers up. So on the, the topic of standards for curation, some posted standards will be helpful, but individual repositories need to be able to define specific requirements too. And this was a comment by Trina Roberts. I wonder if anyone wanted to kind of follow up on how the S&P is viewed in, uh, in terms of that. Not my area of expertise, unfortunately. No, and and I I I mean, on the one hand, this would this would there aren't any rules about any of this. This is all just theoretical. So it seems to me that that point goes in the category of things to consider when writing them. If if NSF is going to follow up and and write requirements for this, they might actually want to have some kind of language in there about bycatch or or salvage. Um, 
I think in the end, it doesn't really change it. The, the whole idea is that whatever those specimens are, whether collected accidentally or intentionally for the project, the, the, the best practice would be that there is a plan for how those specimens are deposited and cared for going forward. And that's really all that's intended by a specimen management plan. Barb, if I can if I can add to that, the one thing I would say is that I do think a lot of these efforts that NSF has put in place, I'm thinking about uh, mentoring plans for postdocs and things, are designed not only to have best practices, but also to elicit more thought into what would do a better job down the road. And so I see some of this as an opportunity to improve our, our thinking generally about, about how to best do some of this. Great, thank you. And that actually, I think maybe lead really nicely to another question we've had, and that is um, what can be done to educate researchers um, about how to write SMPs? And I think that could actually extend to what can be done to educate also collections institutions and researchers to together write these SMPs. Well, I guess, go ahead, go ahead, John. I was just, I, I'm, I'm gonna say I'm, guessing that most of the people uh, out there who have written NSF grants have actually borrowed language with respect to uh, best practices from other people for various parts of their NSF grants. And so I think we can put out some ideas and and again, we can we can actually see improvement on those ideas if it's adopted as the specimen management plans go forward. Um, data management plans are the are a similar example of that. And that was one of the things we were building on and talking about all this. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. I mean, I imagine just as there were instructions for the data management plan, there would be for the specimen management plan now. I mean, that isn't going to get to the issue of what really are the best practices in each community. And as I was mentioned earlier, we need instructions on how to do that. Um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna mute myself. Great. And I think also as mentioned in several of the comments coming up in chat, you know, there are some programs that have included already some mention of SMP within the uh, data management plans. Um, and, and so there are some things out there to start from, though, you know, not to the extent to what the, the proposed specimen management plan kind of covers. And hopefully it'll help clarify and outline things in a little better manner. Um, and some things are, are kind of nebulous currently. Um, let's see. Lori, can I, can I make one comment real quick? This oh, is yes, Gil. please go ahead, Gil. Um, so I'm still thinking about Carol Spencer's question that got partially answered by Andy and about, you know, um, how does this get paid for? And does the NSF add money? And the way I've always looked at this is th there is a pie and a research project is a slice of that pie. And every time that slice of that pie gets bigger, somebody else's slice gets smaller. So I think we've really got to work out a way to make sure that there are funds available, that we don't continue to shrink the pie so much that we're not actually providing the funds that need to be done for the work. So I think Carol's comment was really well made. And I think it's not in our SMP right now about deal with the financing. Yeah, I'd like to add on to that. So in it, uh, so the part of this plan is to make sure that the collections that are preserving and making these specimens available to future generations get a slice of that pie to allow that to happen. Currently, the almost all of the burden for maintaining these collections lies with the host institution. There's very little funding from the researchers who deposit those specimens to pay for the cost of getting them into the collection and preserve for, for future researchers. So this is a mechanism to include in that project budget a small amount of funding, just enough to cover the costs for those specimens. So yeah, so it's a way of making sure the collections get a bite of that pie. And and I'll just point out that that although we didn't get the kind of increases that were potentially talked about at NSF uh, 
in the recent round of, of budgeting, there's actually been a lot of interest in trying to increase NSF's budget. And if that budget increases, now suddenly there's more money to distribute and specimen management plans would be an ideal way to make a case for the kinds of things that we need with respect to an increase in budget in NSF if that happens. Yes, I think it's a, a, a nice note is that uh, by Katharina Dittmar is that NSF has actually already updated individual solicitations to reflect the SMP language in the Chips and Science Act. So there's a lot of this actually already being formally included. So some of that ground is laid. I don't know if we have anyone from NSF here that that may could speak on that or any you know ideas on um, kind of how that's getting integrated or uh, what funding considerations might be there. If so, just let us know. Okay, Catherine is answering in the uh, in the chat there. Um, and saying that NSF doesn't have additional funds at the current time that are dedicated particularly to the uh, data management plans in the CHIPS Act, but that the costs that are associated with collections need to be included in the NSF budget. Um, so that's what we're seeing. Okay, and that the chat is disabled and only Q&A is working. Thank y'all for using the Q&A in that way <laughs> to make that, to overcome that. Um, appreciate that. Um, all right, let's see. We have maybe one more minute. Let me see if there's another one that we can answer pretty quickly. I should note that we will be um, posting the video recording of this webinar um, so you can re-review things or share with colleagues that were interested and couldn't make it. We'll also be answering uh, anything that we didn't get to during this that was put in the chat. And so we'll, we'll have a mechanism to be able to continue this conversation and discussion. Um, as we go on. Some of this I know will take some digesting and it's gonna take a lot of figuring out from the community. Um, and I think in the interest of time, I think we'll go ahead and uh, wrap up this Q&A portion and uh, we'll turn this back. Thank you, Dori. And, and, and thanks to all our speakers and panelists for sharing their thoughts and perspectives. Um, and to the audience for those great questions. We, we certainly hope to have additional conversations like this in the future to explore additional aspects of the specimen management plan requirement. And, and we hope and, and we'll endeavor to keep you all posted and, and engaged in that. Um, today's recording, as Dori mentioned, will be made available online and we encourage you to share that with your colleagues. I would also like to sort of end this program with a request. Uh, so we need your input on our proposal and um, your thoughts in general on the specimen management plan requirement. So as a result, we've created a survey, uh, the link for which will be put into chat, um, as well as shared in a follow-up email uh, right after this webinar, along with the link to the recording. So, you know, we, and I also wanna say that we wanna offer ourselves, BCon and USCCN, we wanna offer ourselves as resources to participate in community-focused discussions. Um, if this is of interest, so please don't hesitate to contact us um, on the links that are on your screen right now. And with that, I just want to, again, thank everyone for joining us and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. All. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. All right, and to, to our speakers and panelists, uh, I will be closing this meeting and I've sent you an invite for another uh, meeting right after this. See you all there. <laughs>